In 1998, Intel introduced a line of processors that became famous for their ease of overclocking. But there's an aspect that there is little information on. If one of these CPUs is great, would two be twice as nice? I was given an interesting vintage motherboard to check out. It's based on the Intel 440BX chipset and has a decent selection of AGP, PCI, and ISA slots for expansion. I'll need to use those slots as it doesn't have video or sound on board, which was pretty typical for the time. But what wasn't typical, at least for home users, was that this board was made by Supermicro, a company that catered to the workstation and server market. Oh, and instead of just one CPU socket, it has two. Let's get it built up. The board came with 128 megabytes of PC100 RAM, which should be plenty to start, but I'd need to add, well, everything else. In a previous episode, we explored the legacy of Intel's Celeron CPU line, specifically a model known as the 300A. In short, while it was a 300 MHz processor, people were able to overclock it to 450 or more without much effort. My attempt at doing so fell a bit short due to limitations imposed by the motherboard, so I was hopeful this one would give me another shot at it. Since the 300A has a locked multiplier, I needed to adjust the jumpers on the board accordingly. It sure is convenient when manufacturers print this info directly on the PCB. Because I want to make sure everything works as is, first I left the bus speed jumper alone for now. And just for good measure, I threw in a new clock battery. There's one last thing to add, and it's this. A Terminator card for the second CPU slot. These are necessary if you're only populating one processor, and it's the kind of thing that tends to get lost over time, but impossible to find a replacement for. I didn't want to disassemble the machine I'd built previously to swap this board into. Luckily, when I was out at Free Geek Twin Cities, I picked up this. It's a Lian Li PC60 from 2002 in this simultaneously hideous and amazing copper color. For 25 bucks, I couldn't say no, especially since it includes these wood grain touches. And just look at that burl. <clears throat> oh, oh, excuse me. It's definitely showing its age. Behind the bezel is an air filter for the two front fans, and it crumbles at the slightest touch. There's also a neat switch here that lets you control the speed. I've heard plenty about Lian Li cases, but never owned one myself, and now I'm sorry for having missed out, as this thing is really nicely built. It's made entirely of aluminum, and while it isn't new, it doesn't seem to be missing any parts. The power supply is screwed to a plate, which is then held to the case with just two thumb screws. It's made by Enermax and rated for 350 watts. They were highly regarded at the time, so this should be a good choice for my needs, but it's also over 20 years old, so I wanted to test it in the garage first, just in case the magic smoke got let out. Thankfully, it works fine and all the voltage rails look good. Something else really nice about this case that makes assembly easier is this. After taking out a half dozen thumb screws from the back, the entire motherboard tray slides out. I'm starting to see why Lian Li got its reputation. There's a lot of nice design touches here, like how the motherboard standoffs clip into place easily, and that there's a ton of locations to put them. Screws had been conveniently left in the standoffs for me to reuse so I could drop the motherboard in and secure it. The debate then came to what cards to add. For video, I went with a GeForce FX 5200 from 2003. It's nowhere near period accurate for this build, but I could say that it's a good choice because it means any gaming benchmarks won't be limited by the GPU, letting any CPU performance changes stand out. And that would be true, but what's also true is, well, it's just what I had on hand. For audio, a tried and true Sound Blaster Live, which was a very popular card during its time. Next up was some wiring and another small detail that I really appreciate. The front panel cabling for the power button and such has a detachable harness. 
no need to get the headers plugged into the motherboard in the confines of the case. Why aren't all computer cases like this? Let's get the rest of the chassis populated. The drive bay covers are made of aluminum like the rest of the case and just snap in. Filling those bays are pretty ordinary CD and floppy drives, though I'll admit picking a faceplate color was a bit of a challenge. I chose black, though maybe beige would have worked okay too. I wonder what people went with back when this case was new. The hard drive choice was an interesting one. Instead of Seagate or Western Digital, I went with a 4.3 gigabyte unit from... Trigem? They were a South Korean PC manufacturer, perhaps most famous for their involvement with the E-Machines joint venture. So it's quite possible that's what this drive is from. But it has a familiar shape I can't quite put my finger on. I think I've seen this drive before. One problem with that drive. I wanted to install it in one of the 3.5 inch front bays, but it won't fit all the way with the cover in place. There is a dedicated cage at the bottom for this that can hold 5 drives, and of course it just takes a couple thumb screws to hold it in. 5 drives would have been a lot, even for an enthusiast, so part of me wonders if this case would have also been used for custom built servers. Perhaps the only annoying thing about this case is the internal structure makes it kind of difficult to deal with cabling for drives in the topmost bays. Hopefully the optical drive works so I don't have to screw around with it too much. Then I could slide the whole motherboard tray back in, expansion cards and all, and plug in the cabling. So easy. I stuffed the PSU wiring in through the back, and given the number of Molex connectors, it made me wonder if this case had been used for a server. Another look at the front panel, and I had my answer. Threeware made storage controllers used in servers and workstations. There's a problem with that front panel in that it isn't staying on very well. Its tabs lock into plastic clips on the case, but one's gone missing and the other is broken. Brittle plastic strikes again, but thankfully someone's already come up with 3D models for replacements. I got some printed out, and they look perfect. I'll put the link in the video description. So with the bezel sorted and the internal wiring tidied as best I could, I crossed my fingers and fired the machine up. Looking good. It complained about the CMOS data because of the battery swap, but I was able to get to the graphical BIOS utility and configure things appropriately. On a machine of this vintage, I'd normally install Windows 98, but for reasons we'll get to in a bit, I decided to go with Windows 2000 instead. Let's get a baseline benchmark. I let PC Mark 2002 do its thing, and the Celeron at its stock 300 MHz scored 796, 16 points faster than it did under Windows 98 previously. Interestingly, PC Mark knows it's running on a dual CPU motherboard and reports that the second slot has a Celeron in it, but that it isn't doing anything. This is a side effect of the Terminator that's installed. Quake 3 Arena was up next, and with the resolution at 800x600 and the detail maxed out, the GeForce card did a solid job as one would expect, managing 37.5 frames per second. But here's a neat fact about Quake not many are aware of. It supports multiple CPUs, unlike most games from its era. And that's also why I installed Windows 2000 on here, because it's multiprocessor aware, whereas Windows 98 isn't. And conveniently, I was able to borrow a second Celeron 300A. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? You don't have to do anything with this motherboard to switch to dual CPUs other than remove the Terminator and install the second processor. I pressed the power button and the machine fired up, but then did nothing. I knew the second Celeron was good, so maybe it was a BIOS issue. I pulled the second CPU and updated the BIOS, which went fine. But still, with two CPUs installed, it just wouldn't post. Some research revealed an unfortunate truth. When Intel modified the Pentium 2 series to use as the basis for the Celeron line, it disabled support for multiprocessing. This was done likely to preserve profits, so that those buying servers or professional workstations had to go with the more expensive Pentium chips. This does call into question why then Intel left the Celeron 300A and its siblings so easy to overclock, 
since they could have locked them to their 66 MHz bus speed while they were at it. My best guess? They did it intentionally in a gambit to stick it to AMD, whose K6 series CPUs were considered a better value. But I'm not sure we'll ever get an official answer. Anyway, I was stuck. In stock form, two Celerons in this board just wouldn't work. While looking into it, I ran across an old page by Tomohiro Kawada, who ran into the same problem and ended up figuring out a workaround. It involves modifying both CPUs, adding a few bodge wires, but also drilling out a via in order to disconnect a trace. This was tricky work and few people attempted it. I didn't want to try the mod on these 300 A's, largely because one of them is on loan to me and I didn't want to take the risk of damaging it. But also due to another annoying problem that would make doing so less interesting. You can't easily overclock a 300 A in this motherboard either. Well, kind of. There's a jumper to force the bus speed to either 66 or 100 MHz, and with it in the latter position, the system does power on and shows a glimmer of hope. The chip is running at 450 MHz. But the machine consistently freezes while booting Windows. Sometimes it makes it a little further, but it's clear that once some load gets put on the Celeron, it gets unhappy. Frustratingly, Supermicro doesn't offer the ability to change the CPU voltage on this board, which was the same problem I faced last time. It is possible to cover some pins on the CPU's card edge to force an increase from 2.0 to 2.2 volts, and that very well could do the trick. But I've got a safer option that should at least offer some closure to my Celeron overclocking journey. The second 300A will do 450 as is, no tweaking required. So let's put that one through its paces. The PC Mark score shot up to 1207 from 796 when the CPU was at 300 megahertz. And leading credence to my justification for video card choice, Quake 3 gained almost 20 frames per second, up to 56.6. The CPU is indeed now the bottleneck. But the big question I couldn't fully answer last time. How does an overclocked Celeron 300A compare to a Pentium 2 450? Let's drop one in and find out. It scored slightly worse, actually. 1183 versus 1207 of the Celeron in PC Mark, and exactly 1.5 frames per second slower in Quake. A Celeron 300A overclocked to 450 MHz really did live up to the hype, which shouldn't be surprising, but it's still nice to confirm with real numbers. It's a bummer I couldn't explore multiprocessing. That'll need to wait for another time when I can get my hands on a pair of identical Pentiums to throw in here. It also doesn't necessarily mean there wasn't a way to get a dual Celeron system working easily, as there were Socket 370 boards that let you get away with some shenanigans Intel wouldn't have liked. But I can at least answer one last question from earlier. That TriGem hard drive was manufactured by Samsung. This was still a fun system to put together, especially with how much of a gem this case turned out to be. They weren't cheap when they were new, either. At a time when the typical ATX case cost less than 50 bucks, the PC60 sold for 145. But you got what you paid for, and it was easier to justify dropping that kind of money if you could find savings elsewhere. Like buying Intel's cheapest CPU and pushing it to its limits. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. Here's another episode you should check out. And as always, thanks for watching.